Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. One of the claims that I have is that economics has become religion um, or priests. We do a similar thing people listen to. The question, what shall I do, which was originally placed, um, asked, people asked Jesus this question. This is what um, we ask economists today. As you know, the government has two tools how to influence the economy. One is called the fiscal policy, and the other one is called monetary policy. And let me tell you, in both of these um, uh, policies, uh, an alternative uh, explanation how, how these developed. Let's start with fiscal policy. Monetary policy, just briefly put, is the monopoly of the government to print money. This is, of course, simplification, but for the purposes of the debate, this will suffice. And fiscal policy is the monopoly of the government to indebt others, as if in your stead. We are now in sort of a, a business cycle, a very, very strange kind of a maybe we're getting from the bottom back again, but it definitely is a business cycle. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is what was the very first business cycle and compare it to the current most recent one. Okay, so what is the oldest business cycle in the written history of mankind? It is the Pharaoh's dream in Genesis chapter 32 when, when Pharaoh had a dream about seven fat and seven lean cows. This is the very first business cycle that we know of in the history of mankind. I, I, I tried to search deeper. I couldn't find any, anything uh, as close as, as this. So Pharaoh has a dream, seven fat cows, seven lean cows. He doesn't know what to make of it, so he calls Joseph. Joseph is a, is a Hebrew prophet, and he says, well, congrat in today's language, of course. He says, congratulations, Pharaoh. You just had a macroeconomic prediction 14 years <laughs> Uh, ahead of time, so to speak. You will have, and this is the point where I will use the flip chart. You will have seven good years and seven bad years, lean years. So here we have grain, or today we would say GDP. So he asks, what can be done? And uh, Joseph says, well, you know, because he was reading your great economist, John Maynard Keynes, so he was educated in Keynesian. He said, well, in the good years, do not eat everything that grows, but save, and he says one-fifth, this is, of course, 20% of GDP growth, and um, store it as a sort of an energy in your store grain houses, as if in a battery, and then, of course, this is, not hard to predict, spend it, invest it uh, during the bad years. So in other words, here he was doing saving, and then this word is investment, this one we know very well. So in other words, you take the energy from the good years, so in other words, you slow down GDP growth, which is a common misunderstanding, the understanding that I think politicians and the general public have, and even many economists about themselves, that the role of the economist is to increase GDP growth. This is nonsense. The role of the economist is to decrease the amplitude of the business cycle. So if we are to increase GDP growth from minus 10 to, say, minus 3, then we must inevitably slow down GDP growth during the bad years. So in other words, in good years do, um, well, in bad years do expansionary fiscal policy and in good years do contractory fiscal policy. In other words, um, today we would say, take in more taxes, this is T, than you give out in expenditures. This sounds very provocative, but the economy behaves often like a bipolar um, a patient with a bipolar disorder, it tends to overdo its good uh, uh, years and turn them into ma ma manias, and it also tends to exaggerate its bad mood and turn into depression. Now, those of you who have ever encountered 
bipolar disorder or manic depressive uh, situation, you know that the first thing to treat if you want to treat a patient in this situation is you treat the manias. Now let's fast forward some 3,000 years till today. Okay, we also had seven very good years. In fact, if you want to be somewhat ironic, you could even go down and say that th these seven years have been bracketed by two significant events in the history. One was the year 2001, which wasn't just important for the September attacks, but you know that this was the last year when America had surplus budget in, in, in the Clinton administration. This is the year when, when the presidency changed. This is also the year when, um, uh, when Fed started charging extremely aggressively low levels of, of, of interest rate, etc., etc. Then uh, the world had a great seven years, not just America, not just Great Britain, but the whole of Europe, and in fact, the whole of our civilization, and even um, the whole world. The whole world grew in average in 5% uh, 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 GDP growth per year, which is which was crazy. This was ended by Lehman Brothers, 2008, and it was also September. So anyway, my point here is it was seven good years, even in our times, that we actually enjoyed this robust levels of growth. So what have we done? Just to speed up the talk, we've done this. We've done exactly the opposite. We've spent more than we grew. So not only did we eat everything that we could, but this was not only empty, but it was full of IOUs lying all over the floor. Ridding ourselves, of course, of any energy left to save or cushion the bad years. We should have had budget surpluses here, saving energy for, for, for bad years. Instead, we did the exact opposite. Well, anyway, what's my point? My point here is that a story that we tell to seven-year-old children that they can understand, story which is from primitive times of some 3,000 years, story which actually only has very few uncomplicated numbers and no calculations, had in it more wisdom than we have today. We've not been able to persuade our politicians to keep to this basic wisdom with hundreds of thousands of very highly educated economists with all sorts of mathematical models and regressions. We've not been able to, we've not, we've been able to actually overlook this sort of basic, uh, basic wisdom that um, we've seen human, mankind uh, adopt during the first recorded business cycle. Uh, the second point that I have is we are developing this rule, which, should, which is called dynamic fiscal rule, which basically says um, deficit plus GDP growth should be less or equal to a constant, let's say in the case of Czech Republic, number four. In other words, when your GDP grows at 6%, we should have 2% uh, budget surpluses. When your economy is falling by 3%, you can have 7% budget deficits. So it's, it's kind of a rule that, that is more lenient here, and it is more strict here, really going back to the basic uh, Joseph uh, principle. Okay, now let's just very quickly go through monetary policy. Uh, so again, we have fiscal policy that I kind of explained. This is manipulation with debt. And we have monetary policy. This is manipulation with money supply. Now, monetary policy has moved away from politicians. Today, politicians do not have the right to print money. And if they had the right to print money, we in Europe would not have a problem with debt. We would have a problem with excessive inflation, because they would solve the problems by printing money. This is something that we took away from our politicians and gave it to national banks in the first step. And in the second step, we gave it to the European Central Bank, thus making it even more independent. So now government does not have the right to print money. Government still has the right to print debt, which at the end of the day works uh, the same. The sin here is inflation. The sin here is over, over debting uh, uh, the society. So f monetary policy, I argue, is two generations ahead of fiscal policy. 
Now let me use another great uh, British author. I think you've heard of J.I.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. Um, I argue here that both of these powers, although they belong to um, basic definitions of, of sovereignty of a state, are like the ring of power. It is a temptation too strong to bear. Please mind that uh, none of the really great wizards ever touched the, the ring. Right? Anybody who tried to meddle or control the ring ended up being controlled by the ring. So what was the, what was the lesson? The fellowship agreed, we will not use the powers of the ring. It is temptation too difficult. The ring must be destroyed. Imagine that you would have here in your Royal Society of Arts a legal money printing machine. Which one of you would not use it to solve your own problems? <laughs> so uh, I argue here that the same thing should happen to fiscal policy. We should, uh, of course, politicians should have the right to choose who they tax and who they give the money to, but they should not have the right to print additional money in terms of debt. Now, let me focus on monetary policy. You know that interest rate is similar to alcohol. Uh, how is this similar to alcohol? Let's talk about interest rate. Interest rate, and I, as you noticed, I like to not think of money just in terms of money. I like to think of money in terms of energy. Whenever I borrow money, it looks like I borrow money from the bank or for friends or from my father. But what I'm really doing, I'm borrowing the money from myself, from my own future. I'm vacuum cleaning my consumer energy from the future, and I laser invest it today. If I borrow um, $10,000 or pounds, which is better, uh, only a fool would say that I am 10,000 pounds richer. I am, of course, not. I can behave as if I was 10,000 pounds richer, but I really am not. Now, the problem is when government does this, it is con when the UK government borrows 10 billion uh, pounds, it is ap approached and considered as if you were 10,000 pounds richer. So if the growth in the Czech Republic last year was 3.4% of GDP, everybody was going orgastic about it. I merely tried to point out that in the same year, we had 7% budget deficit. So for 7% of GDP, we bought 3.4% growth. Not a good deal. By the way, America in the year 2009, if it had balanced budget, America in the year 2009 would have minus 23% drop in GDP. The number itself isn't important. What's important is nobody asks this anymore. We automatically cushion or speed up by corticoids or anabolics the growth. And this is not GDP. It is gross debt product. We are driven by debt. This is the result. Now, all the Asians have warned us against the use of interest rate. If you start with Aristotle or the Old Testament, you can actually go into Quran and, and, and see uh, the Arabic warnings or the Islamic warning against interest rate all the way till Thomas Aquinas. The ma basic message was be careful about using interest rate. If you can avoid using interest rate, don't use it. We don't know why but there's something spooky about it. <laughs> and closest to the spookiness was Aristotle, who said, time, interest rate is charging money for time. Time does not belong to us, it belongs to God, said Aristotle. We have no right to change interest rate. Of course, this argumentation is pretty weak, and he knew this himself, but he elaborated the concept of time into it. Now, uh, let me try to contribute to the debate and say, why is interest rate spooky? Why is it scary? Why is it ghost-like? And how come it's similar to alcohol? Alcohol can also time travel energy. It can't do it over huge leaps of time, like interest rate. Interest rate can carry energy 40 years there and forth. If we didn't have interest rate, uh, time, money time travel would be almost impossible. Nobody would borrow, nobody would lend. Now, something that all the Asians have warned us against, we have made this a cornerstone of our society. Our society would not be able to function without interest rate. The way our society is built today is that we need most money 
in the beginning of our careers when we need to buy a car, uh, we have children, we need to buy a house, but we have most money at our disposal towards the end of our careers when we all become CEOs and CFOs of our respected companies. And, but we don't need the money at 60. So what we do, this is of course an individualistic modern society when we want to live alone, we time travel the money from here to here. In other words, we live most of our lives in houses that we don't own. This is called leasing, uh, this is called mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. And we do this thanks to the interest rate. And now, alcohol, I'm coming to it, can also time travel energy. So let me give you an example. Um, when on occasional Friday evening, you feel having much more energy than other days, you are dancing on the bars, you have midnight energy, and everybody looks very sexy. What's most surprising, you yourself seem very attractive to yourself. <laughs> and you talk to people, in my case, girls, uh, in this I'm old school, uh, uh, that I would normally never have the guts to talk to, but because of this extra energy, I actually can approach them and, and, and at least to myself seem entertaining. Now, the common mistake to make is to attribute this uh, additional energy to the usage of alcohol. No. The only thing alcohol does is it vacuum cleans, and it time travels your Saturday morning energy, <laughs> and it invests it into... Uh, Friday evening, but the energy of the weekend is constant. You have noticed that, I think, in your lives. Now, it's absolutely fine to get drunk on a Friday evening if you know that you have nothing important to do on a Saturday. It's not very clever to get drunk on a Sunday evening when you know there's an important meeting on Monday morning. And this is what's spooky about interest rate, is that you can pretty much know what's happening the next morning, so you can plan your energy travel but you will never know whether these two hills will match. In other words, in good faith and hope, again, Christian principles, we borrow and we lend. In hope and faith that this hill will be equal or bigger than this hill. There is no mathematical apparatus that can assure this. It's not the problem of math, it's a problem of fundamental uncertainty about the future. So, in other words, we get drunk here and we land with our hangover on Monday morning when we need a lot of energy because we have um, traveled to do or an important business meeting. This is one way how to read, um, how to read um, the um, financial um, uh, meltdown that these two hills have not met. Obviously, we've had this financial crisis recently. Do you think that if uh, economists and politicians had paid attention to what you say in your book, we would have avoided the financial crisis? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> uh, it would have been... It would have been uh, we, we ran out of energy. We spent the energy that was kind of made to help us during the bad times. We spent it here. Deficit spending is a gift. It's something that is fine. It's, it's legitimate. It allows us to not die of hunger during the famine times. But then again, if it's used unwisely, it, it enslaves us, like the ring. So we now hope for a political messiah who will come and who will actually put this thing in order. I would much rather change the system, give it a firm rule, take this temptation away from politicians so that you don't have to pray and hope for an idiot. Here, this is idiot proof. You can actually have an idiot for whatever office he or she will hold. He will not be tempted by using the ring because the ring will be destroyed. So my hope is in not individual politicians. This is too big a temptation for them to bear. I would not be able to bear it, and I think you wouldn't be able to bear it too. If they would listen to me, this is of course thinking a little too much of myself, but anyway, the question was asked. Uh, we would have slowed down GDP growth here, created much more energy for fiscal bailouts here. So the crisis wouldn't, be, wouldn't have to be... <coughs> yeah, so it wouldn't necessarily have prevented the crisis, but it would have yes. left the energy to I don't think there is a way to result, prevent a crisis, yes. Yeah. Obviously, some of the ideas in your book may seem unconventional to some economists. I hope so, yes. Yeah. Do you see any prospect that the economics profession will start to take these thoughts on board? 
in the coming decades? This is the way economics started. Economics started as a sub-branch of philosophy, asking moral questions. Thomas Aquinas asks economic questions in Summa Theological in, question, uh, in the second book, in the question 68, when he asks himself, do I have the right to own two shirts when my brother or sister has none? So it's a moral question out of which he actually develops this whole system of private rights and when is it uh, uh, okay to steal. If you're dying of hunger, he says it's okay to steal, but otherwise it's not okay to steal. Also, by the way, this is interesting. In, in the Old Hebrew, in the Old Testament, you see economic growth as a function of ethics, so to speak. So if the kingdom, if the king behaved properly, if the voice of the widow was heard and if the orphans were protected, then through the instrument of divine justice, uh, uh, the country was blessed economically and politically and the country prospered. If, however, uh, the country didn't behave morally, then, uh, then it went down politically, was attacked by a, 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 a another country, or just suffered economically. So, okay. so, so I think economics is kind of, uh, has neglected this because of the invisible hand of the market, which says personal ethics is irrelevant. There is, no, uh, there is no relationship. This is the famous feeble um, um, uh, of bees or how private vices create public benefits. It doesn't matter whether you behave ethically or unethically in the market. The invisible hand of the market has the power to transform that into A+. Plus. So in, in a sense, I guess you're saying that what you're doing here is really a return to the yes, this the is roots kind of, of economics. I don't want to replace current economics. Yeah. I want add. I, I would like to. This is my dream to add a philosophical basin so that we we know what we're we're talking about. Yeah. This GDP is not GDP. That's one of my points. This debt is not debt. Greek debt doesn't exist. I argue it always was pan-European debt, and we see it today. Greek is not paying its debts. We are paying it in its stead. In the original Greek, in the New Testament Greek, the word for debt, ophelon, is the same to the word sin. This is true in, in Latin, de minimos debita nostra, forgive us our debits. Uh, this is also true in Aramaic, this is true in German, for example, till today. So, uh, so not only is economics unthinkable without some moral values which we mostly have from Christianity. I'm not opting here for, for Christianity. It's just it so happened that we have been influenced by this. But Christianity would not be able to function without economics because Jesus and even in the Old Testament, they borrowed so many economic terminology. The, the whole concept of redemption is when you have indebted yourself too much, you are falling under the weight of debt or sin. You become a debt slave or slave to sin, these two words again you can interchange at will, and you need somebody to bail you out, to redeem you. So it's kind of funny that this happened to Greece with the original Greek.